This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are talking with Mark Helprin about his latest novel, Paris and the Present Tense. Mark Halperin is a leading novelist. He is an acclaimed number one New York Times bestselling author of several uh, novels, including A Winter's Tale and Sunlight and in Shadow, A Soldier of the Great War, Freddie and Federica, um, and, and also two collections of short stories. Uh, the novels have been translated into more than 20 languages. In addition, uh, Mark Halperin frequently appears on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal in the Claremont Review of Books, in the National Review, among other publications, uh, talking usually about foreign policy and defense policy. He, uh, This is his third time to appear on Liberty Law Talk. I'll talk about that maybe more in a minute, a connection with this novel. But Mark, it's really, uh, it's just wonderful to have you on the program and to interview you about your latest novel. Thank, thank you so much. And please forgive me for being a, a school marmish, but it's 25 languages. 25 languages. Excellent. I was going by uh, your publisher's description. So uh, oh, what 20. Do they, what do they know? Yeah. What do they know? 25. Well, that's that's excellent. And so I have interviewed you on In Sunlight and In Shadow. And then, and I think a, a connection with this novel, um, the uh, the horrible, uh, horrific event, the, the Bataclan Massacre, uh, which happened in Paris in November of 2015, were over uh, 70 people died, I think, uh, scores more, uh, 100, over 100 were injured uh, in a terrorist attack at a, a rock concert. And you were gracious enough to uh, grant me an interview uh, a day later. Uh, and, uh, and, and we talked about the massacre and the implications for France, uh, for Europe, for the European Union. And you had said in that interview, you had just left Paris researching uh, for what was going to be your new novel that, of course, was... Paris in the present tense. So I, as I as I began reading the novel, Mark, I really felt a connection with it along those lines. I think it's safe to say that uh, the massacre, the attack of Charlie Hebdo, uh, among other you know, the ongoing tragedies of lost count uh, that have happened in Europe since then, really shaped uh, your writing in this novel. Or am I wrong? Well, uh, only to a certain extent. Okay. I mean, uh, the uh... The, the 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 fact is that in in France, particularly, of course, we know that these things happen all over Europe, and they're mostly externally motivated. In other words, you have fairly recent immigrants or people who've had who've gone back to Pakistan or uh, Syria or Iran or wherever, and then they come back to uh, Britain, Germany, uh, not so much Italy. Notice Italy has a truce with seems to have a truce with the with the terrorists. But they or Spain now is is subject to it has been, they come back. Whereas in France, it's it's mainly from the resident population uh, of Muslims who who were France's responsibility in Algeria who have then come to France and some uh, African Muslims too. I mean, uh, sub-Saharan African Muslims. And in France, they this this community, which is similar to the community in Germany. Um, because they are there uh, originally, they have they were there originally because France needed labor, and Germany has let in these million or so, uh, more than a million refugees from very very uh, warlike, unstable places such as Syria, because Germany has a demographic crisis and it needs labor. It did it once before in the starting in the 50s with the Turks, and it has done it. Now, despite what they say about humanitarian things, of course, there's some of that, but it's the decision was a real politic decision to solve Germany's demographic crisis because without uh, youth and labor, uh, Germany will be in very big trouble. And uh, Angela Merkel knows this. But in France, uh, they are living with the with the the um, uh, legacy of that decision and also the legacy of French colonialism in Algeria. Uh, now, the the Islamic community in France is the biggest in Europe of any European country, it's, um, 10% or more. And the the Muslims in France have not been integrated. Uh, this is partly this is I would say it's mainly the fault of the Muslims themselves, but it's also 
certainly the fault of the French, because the French have uh, um, it's too complicated to go into, but but it is also the fault of the French. None, whose ever fault it is, you have an isolated community which is which is seething and has also been influenced by the jihadists uh, from the outside. And what has happened is you have two targets in France. You have everybody as a, as a target, such as the Bataclan uh, massacre uh, and, and, and others. And then you have specifically the Jews in France, because as is well known, jihadists are not particularly affectionate toward Jews. And in America, uh, we do not, uh, the press doesn't emphasize, uh, nor should it, I guess, emphasize, but it, it underreports what's going on with the Jews in France, uh, most of whom are absolutely terrorized in one form or another. They, they can't send their children to school. Uh, they have to have special schools. Uh, in school, the children have to hide. If they can't, the Jews can't wear their, uh, their kippot, which is mainly known as the yarmulke, on the street. Because they get beaten up. Jews have been kidnapped. One particular instance, which was terrible, which was a young Jewish religious boy who was kidnapped and held for a very long time. For two weeks. Two weeks. That's a long time because he was under torture. Yep. They, they called the parents as they tortured him to death. And the parents couldn't hang up because the, their, their son was on the other end of the line. And, and can, you can imagine the, the, uh, the, the misery of the parents hearing their son tortured to death. Uh, the, the, p women have been thrown out of windows. Uh, school children have been massacred. There are actually in France um, uh, what they call uh, Zionist free zones. When you can read that as Judenfrei, Jew free zones. And the, 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 the litany uh, goes on and on and on. And many yeah. Jews have decided to, to, to leave France. So that's the background. That's one background. But this yeah. ties also into the Holocaust because uh, the also participating in this, and this is the, the, what really scares the Jews in France, is the right wing in, in France, the, the uh, uh, National Front, uh, which, which has, is divided in, essentially into two sections, but, but one of them is the old guard, and they are essentially uh, Nazi sympathizers, more or less. Uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen called the Holocaust famously a detail of history. Um, and and they have they have taken in all these Vichy type of people, but the, when the, the amazing thing is that the right and the and the the uh, jihadi Muslims, the the anti-Semitic Muslims, have come together at times. Specifically, there was a uh, a, a comedian whose name was Dieudonné, which is strange because it means gift of God. But Louis the Fourteenth was also called Dieudonné. His real name is Mabala Mabala. He's an African Muslim, and he w made his, his mark by mocking the Holocaust and making jokes about that. And the right wing, the, the FN, were his audiences as much as the Arabs. They got together. They both agreed on this. That's, the back, that's one background. And what, what it really harkens back to is the Holocaust, because the French Jews experienced that as well. So there's a, a sort of a little portrait of where they are now. Yeah, and, and I wanna I wanna talk more about uh, obviously the, the novel. Uh, you know, it, it is interesting. You you mentioned Germany and, and the German situation of, of over a million uh, Middle Easterners who have come into that country over the past two years. You know, my, my what I have read, uh, Christopher Caldwell uh, among others. Germany's demographic situation is so dire that they would have to bring in actually even more uh, th than they presently have. Uh, and and we know from what I'm reading in the last election is a testament to that. There's no appetite for that, uh, yeah, or, and and it will that. only and the backlash will only get worse. I would imagine if they tried. And now the situation is, from what I'm reading, sub-Saharan African migrants coming into Europe, of which there could be no no end. And and the backlash, obviously, in in other countries. Uh, I mean, there was there was a video recently you may have seen in Spain on a Spanish beach, of of a rubber boat coming ashore, and you know, ten guys get out and run across the beach, and there are all these families vacationing. I mean, that's you know, that sort of feeling of, and this is also part of the European Union and this sort of collective helplessness uh, that people feel, uh, and they express that the only way they can, which would you know be at national elections or. Uh, parliamentary elections. 
Um, it also seems to me those who have come into Germany probably can't participate at the level they need economically. They just don't have the education, the skills, the the abilities that that would be required to to make that argument uh, work. What do you think? Well, the bet was that they could teach them, uh, and uh, they and the Germany was going to continue this, but it was stopped by the by the backlash. Uh, and I did see the. The video of the guys getting out from from the rubber boat, <clears throat> and and I just want to say that in 1980, I believe in 1981, I gave a speech at the New York Public Library, in which I predicted that I, I was a little off, but I said by the by the turn of the century, uh, you would have massive invasions from the third world into Europe, and people thought I was nuts. I mean, they they, they, they some people got up and walked out in in protest. And they said, why? And I said, because the, uh, the way things are going, the third world is not progressing uh, fast enough, and it will politically disintegrate. And there'll be a lot of war and violence and economic disruption. Uh, and the people will move the way they have since the beginning of time. You know, if you look at the, uh, at the Gauls, the, the um, transalpine Gauls, and the, or, the, or the Germans, in, first in early Rome and then later in, in Rome toward its end, vast numbers of people cannot be stopped uh, when they move from, from uh, one continent to the other or one half a continent to the other. Uh, so I think that, that, uh, that this is uh, something that, yeah, Germany, Germany has an ongoing demographic problem. Uh, the balance will be between the backlash and the desire of um, real politic officials to solve it by taking in immigrants. So maybe with that, we'll sort of move in uh, to the novel. Uh, you know, I'll start with a, a basic question. Uh, why Paris in the present tense? That's an interesting title. Uh, that's, that's strange because um, originally I had thought to make it Paris in the present tense because I wanted to write a novel in the present tense. It's an interesting form. I've never used it before. I've used it in, in one short story, I think, out of uh, you know, scores or hundreds. And I thought, well, I can do that. I want to do this and see, see what it's like. But I started writing it, and it, it, uh, I, I ended up writing it in, the, in my normal fashion, which is not in the present tense, although there is one chapter in the present tense, and I think it fits okay that way. Um, because it's a reminiscence uh, a flashback. Okay. And and so I decided at that point when it wasn't in the present tense, I decided to call it the music of Paris because it's so much about music and musicians and the the, uh, the ineffable qualities of music and how music intertwines with life and and what it is, etc. But then uh, then I decided to bring it back because I realized that it was very important that this takes place in the, in the present. It's not a historical novel. Uh, it, it's a, um, something that is of the moment. And, yeah. And, and also, of course, it, I mean, this is a, a kind of a silly pun, but uh, in, in the present, Paris is very tense, uh, despite all its other glories. It is extremely tense. If you just go there, you can feel it. And I have a lot of other puns in the book. Yeah. And since the uh, there's an insurance salesman whose name is Armand Marteau, but uh, Marteau <laughs> in French means hammer, and arm yeah. and hammer, uh, and, and you know I do that just for fun, but uh, hoping not to distract anybody. But you know if, if someone can can see it, well, good. And oh, and, and you've also got the CEO of the international um, insurance financial securities conglomerate. Uh, his name is Rich Panda. Uh, uh, originally, originally it was uh, Richard Panda. Richard Panda. Was, and originally, before his parents changed it, it was Pandolfsky, but they changed it to Panda, uh, thinking that it would be more American. <laughs> yeah. So thinking about it, you mentioned, you know, but one, one question, your novels uh, frequently center uh, around great cities, uh, and, you know, and Sunlight and in Shadow was, was New York City, and you emphasized, I, I thought, many, many aspects of the city. One thing was just how wet uh new york city is how it's uh, surrounded by water and then but paris uh why, why did you choose paris for this novel and you know another part of this novel which i really enjoyed is uh jewel the the protagonist is a rower uh, and uh, frequently 
uh, rose, I think, what, uh, two miles a day or something on, on the more Seine. Than two miles, more than two miles. Five, five miles, maybe I'm, I'm mixed up. He swims maybe a mile or two a day sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the rowing, and we get the descriptions of the currents and how he navigates and all this. But I, I just wanted, yeah, that was one question I had for you, uh, Paris. What did it, what, what, why, why Paris for this novel? Well, uh, when I was um, three and four, my father moved us to Paris. And I, I realize now, only now, that um, that when you're when you're pre three and you know when you're one and two, you think that the world centers around you. That's what an infant does. I mean, it, and cognitively, he can be forgiven for that because yeah. because you, you don't know about uh, geography, you don't know what a state is or a country or the world or other people. You're you're self-centered. But when you're around three or four, that changes. And you realize that you're not the center of the world, that there's another, oh, that there's a world outside of you and you're not the most important thing. You orbit around the, the collective it. And I was that age in Paris. So for me, uh, Paris has always been, despite the fact that I'm an American and, and really my home is, my, my emotional home is, is New York. But Paris nonetheless has always been the center of the world, like the Umphalos in, in Delphi that the Greeks thought was the center of the universe. Um, because I became aware that I was not the center while I lived there, and I deeply absorbed it. And then uh, later, between the t ages of uh, 8 and 12, uh, 12, I lived with a French couple whose, name were, uh, was, uh, whose names were Louis and Marie Mignon. Uh, he was uh... a Paulou in the First World War, wounded at, badly wounded at Verdun twice, I think. Uh, received the Legion of Honor, and in the Second World War, when he was um, not, you know, a youth-like age, uh, he he was in the French Resistance with his wife and his son Jacques, who was a teenager at the time, uh, in Reims, and they hid Jews in their attic. And, and so I I was I lived with them for four years, uh, and I I shared a bathroom with them. My bedroom was next to their bedroom, and they didn't speak uh, English. So I, I, my French was gotten from them. I never studied in school, so therefore my grammar, my syntax, I was terrible. But I, but I can still speak a little. But, but they, for them, it was always la guerre, la guerre, la guerre, because the, the the two wars had shaped them. And having hidden Jews in their attic, uh, who were just about discovered by the by the uh, Germans, um, but it, it actually was the charity of a German officer who prevented that. He saw a Hebrew book that had been left on a table, because unlike in my book, these Jews used to come down from the attic and, and partake of family meals and stuff, and they left a Hebrew book on the table. The German officer saw it, but he didn't do anything. He was a good man, um, and the, these people were not discovered. Uh, in the book, it's a different story. Yeah, so I, mean, I think that's the perfect way to introduce Jewel and uh, and and just what, what's I mean, this is a fascinating uh, character you've created here. Maybe just introduce him to us and you know tell us about him. Uh, he he, um, uh, I, I think I can give this away because it's given away in the first part of the book when he goes to do the what he calls the what I the narrator calls at me the impossible, which is to see a psychiatrist in Paris in August. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, I mean you can't you can't do that in New York and in, and and in, in America. We we don't have the, the the unbelievable August tradition of emptying out our cities to go to uh, the beaches and sit half naked in the uh, damaging sunshine. But anyway, uh, he, Jules, as a as a, a four year old, uh, witnesses the execution of his parents, uh, and that of course shapes his life. Uh, when my 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 father helped get some refugees into New York um, during before the war, just before the war, uh, and from from France, from Paris. I still know uh, my my almost contemporary. He's a few years older. He still lives in Paris. He was part of this family, and the uh, uh, the, the, the the milieu that I grew up in was full of Holocaust survivors, uh, two of whom actually experience what I describe in the book. You know, their parents were were actually m murdered right in front of them when they were little. 
one one of these guys is uh, is, is in an institution now. I don't think he'll ever get out. He's uh, schizophrenic and, and suffers uh, from the interior tremendously. The other was a man who died in the late 70s, uh, and he's mentioned in the dedication of the book. But anyway, okay. um, the the uh, this shapes his life. Nonetheless, he refuses absolutely to be a victim. Uh, and this is one of the lessons of the Holocaust, I believe, because it, I, I believe as a as a Jew who who was born just after it, uh, I I believe that it is the duty of anyone who is has family from from that time or anyway feels connected to those people to live life to its fullest and not to think of oneself as a victim, to be able to to enjoy and to fight. And to to be responsible, to bring up a family, to have one's own children, to uh, not to be burdened by it to the point where you don't function, if you possibly can. And this, of course, was a struggle to him for him because he had the the, the deep, deep psychological damage of of, of what he ex- had experienced. And uh, in in some senses, the book is about the the conflict between between uh, the burdens and tragedy and sadness of history uh, as opposed to the necessity to live and seek life and its joy. Talk about uh, what music means uh, for you. And and, and if you don't mind, there's a chapter, uh, I think you do this so well, the chapter is called The Music Lesson. And it's right after uh, Jules' parents are executed by the SS, which... The way you show it in the novel, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, tragedy, uh, but it's, you know, the, the German army is actually fleeing. Uh, the Americans are coming in to where they've been hiding now for four years. And this sort of stray uh, SS uh, contingent uh, hears uh, Jules' father playing a Bach cantata, and he wants to go thank the cellist, thank him for playing this. Uh, as as they're retreating, you know, and and this goodwill gesture results in him discovering the Jewish family, and and he executes uh, Jules' mother and, and father, and then the next chapter, uh, you 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 open with the sentence, uh, he did live, and part of him living, which you you talk about in the book, so much of it is is really music, which takes on, I, I think, for Jules, a, a religious uh, meaning uh, in and of itself, and I, I just read this and maybe get your comment on it. Um, well, you, absolutely. I mean, um, okay. Music is associated with with religion uh, is nothing new. We know about that. Yeah. Uh, and the the couple of things. One, the fact it, it, when Ross was liberated, and this is all based on fact. When I when you mentioned that I was researching the novel, I wasn't researching it. I was checking it. Yeah. And, and okay. For instance, all the all the the. Uh, Description of the liberation of Ross, it's all extremely accurate, you know, to the minute uh, and in and, and every little detail. But in, when Ross was liberated at that point, on the, I forgot the exact date, but I mentioned it in the book, there were, the Marseillaise was being played everywhere. You know, people took out their, their yeah. Victrolas and they, they played it and they sang it, et cetera, et cetera. But the, Jules' father, uh, who was a cellist, and 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 in the in the attic, they had to speak in a whisper all the time, and the and they, he couldn't play the cello for those whole that whole four years, but he he played a Bach uh, cantata, which to him was the most beautiful piece of music ever. He didn't play the Marseillaise. It, 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 he played a German song, uh, German a German piece, yeah. which because he knew that music is higher than. Than politics or history or anything like that, it does have a religious dimension. It exists in itself, and as Jules says to his students in Paris, because he's a he's a uh, maître at the Sorbonne teaching uh, cello, um, music uh, is the closest thing to the voice of God. He actually says music is the voice of God. It can elevate you uh, to the highest place, closest to heaven, that that perhaps anything can. Um, and yeah. he he recognizes this as his father had recognized it, uh, and for him it's a it's the saving grace of of, of life because it transcends every human sin, uh, every human uh, ignorance, etc. It 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 can be the most extraordinary.
extraordinary, beautiful thing uh, beyond the world, really. Uh, as you know, there, there was a uh, yeah. a, a disc jockey, a classical disc jockey named De Coven. Very few people know of him these days. He's long gone. But I used to listen to him when I was young. And he was a very odd, very odd person. And he would describe things as uh, OTW, meaning out of this world. This is the pieces that he played. And then he, he would go on, he would say, well, this is super OTW. And then he would say it was super, super OTW. And then he got all the way up to like super, 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 super OTW, out of this world, uh, because he loved it so much. And he thought that it was, it was something that could actually uh, lift you uh, close to or into a heaven. That's why out of this world. And that's, that's what music is, is about uh, for Jules. It's, a, it's the, the thing that he pinned his life on. Because the the last thing that that he experienced was his father playing this this music before the uh, the, the the tragedy occurred. It wasn't a tragedy; it was a crime. Yeah, no, uh, exactly. No, um, just reading what, what your descriptions of it uh, for, for for Jules and this uh, as he's a young boy, uh, whether or not the rhythm and syncopation of music match the pulse the atomic and subatomic timing within the body, or the symphonic motion of countless electrons in every nerve, channel, and cell. It's a wave-like melody and narrative elevated all things. Without this, Jules, when he was young, would not have been able to go on, so he sought it out. He studied hard and practiced until he bled, and it saved him. And then uh, two paragraphs down, you say, uh, though it never succeeded completely, music promised that sin and suffering might be washed away for Jewel. Yeah, that's exactly. Um, I had kind of forgotten that particular passage, but that's what I've been trying to say. Uh, not as well as I've been talking to you. Yeah. Um, question for you about uh, Jewel. So he is 74 mm -hmm. in the novel and uh, interesting connection with, so he's uh, he's teaches uh, aspiring musicians how to perfect their craft. Teaches at the Sorbonne, but he's not, you know, as we would say in America, I guess, a full professor or uh, considered at the same level uh, academically. But he made that choice on his own. He actually didn't want to enter into that that realm uh, because he would have had to forego what he loved most about music. He would have had to enter into theory. Uh, various other you know ways of thinking about music, and he wanted to stay at its you know say at its essence, um, and and also this other character I want to bring in Francois, who is, uh, I mean, it just sounds strange to me. He's like a rock star philosopher, uh, and is on TV all the time, which is I guess strange for me as an American. Uh, I think about all my right. philosopher friends. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. So yeah. So I was thinking about um, yeah. I, I was thinking about you know, Jules and, and Francois and just how uh, the, this, this interesting connection, uh, friendship they have. Well, uh, as far as Jules um, choosing not to be an academic uh, in music, uh, I think that stems from when I was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. This was a long time getting to be, uh, let's see, one, two, three, it'll be 30 years ago, not so long from now. Um, there were the the academic musicians who who gave concerts, composers, composers. There were composers, but they were they were all academics. They were professors of music at various uh, highfalutin places. Mm. And once we went to a concert there, it was the last concert we attended there, um, and the music sounded something like this. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of stuff. I couldn't I couldn't believe it, and a lot of it was so ugly. That it was like uh, it was it was like noise that you would that you would open the window and scream at someone to stop, and the, all the composers were following the score. And afterwards, I said, um, "Do you think this music was beautiful?" And and I, I, I forgot which one it was that I was speaking to, but he was very famous, and a lot of people might know him uh, if they're interested in this kind of stuff. And he said. He said, beautiful. He said, I don't care if it's beautiful or not. I said, really? He said, yeah. And I said, well, do you think it sounds good? He said, sound is unimportant. I don't care how it sounds. I said, well, what, what, is, uh, what do you care about? And he, and he pointed to the score and he said, look at the patterns of this. Look at the mathematical patterns. It's magnificent. And uh, there's a great pianist named Alfred Brendel. <laughs> he wrote a book called Music Stounded Out. 
it's very important that music actually have a sound and that that sound be uh, pleasing and that it be beautiful. Uh, and I'm not going to get into defining beautiful. Croce wrote a whole book called Aesthetic in which he tried to define what was beautiful and he couldn't do it. Uh, but but uh, that's, that's why Jules decided not to be an academic because he's devoted to the beauty of music not to the theory of music, although he was competent in the theory, he had to be in order to, to teach musicianship. And uh, as far as Francois goes, in France they have a rock star philosophers, if, if you can uh, describe it that way, uh, which is quite extraordinary. I mean, they have famous philosophers who, who, as I say, appear on television and are known even in German truck stops. You know, uh, And Francois is a philosopher based on a particular French, famous French philosopher, current philosopher, whom I will not name. I admire him very much. Um, and of course, it's just based on it. I, I made the character. But he is, uh, he's, a, he's a typical, uh, an atypical French intellectual. He's had many wives. He makes a huge amount of money, but it all goes to alimony and child support. Uh, and he's also brilliant. And he shares the same background as Jules. He's also from Ross. And they're, they're very good friends. Uh, but then their friendship is shattered by, by something that I, I really don't want to give away at this point. Yeah. Which, which leads me to ask you to ask me about the, the, uh, the, the business of a, an older man and a, a younger woman. As, yeah, no, actually, that, that that's funny, Mark. Uh, that, that that was next on my list. Although I, listening to you talk about the music and and Jules, it's almost it's also a part of his character. It seems to me the way you've drawn it to pour himself into other people, and and there's and there's an element of sacrifice there. And it's because you know he has a, a grandson who has leukemia, uh, four years old. He has a daughter who seems to be well, not not distant from, but. Um, it seems to be a tense relationship the way, and then she has an Orthodox Jewish husband, and uh, it's, and he, but he, you know, so a huge part of this novel is him wanting to save his grandson uh, in a way that he couldn't save his parents and also his his wife, who's now deceased, uh, Jacqueline, who died tragically or died from uh, from cancer. Uh, all of this sort of factors into him this this desire to give himself to other people and actually save someone that he loves notice that the, his grandson who is who is in danger of who's mortally ill with leukemia yeah. is four years old as he was when his oh was. yeah but, but anyway um the yes uh the uh the virtues are, are celebrated in this book, in all my books, and that's not popular because the anti-hero and nihilism are what sell these days. But uh, the, the virtues of of uh, self-sacrifice, certainly self-discipline and regulation, um, uh, courage, um, uh, all the all love, uh, right conduct are 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 pronounced in this man, uh, and he has good reason to be this way because of the lessons that he learned very early on. Um, what, I, what I wanted to say, I, there are two things I want to say, if I may, sure. uh, about the, uh, the older man, younger woman, because in the book, uh, his, his wife, to whom he is devoted finally, uh, and, and as opposed to anyone else, even though he's a widower and he's free to remarry or have an affair, whatever he wants to do in that respect, he remains faithful to his wife. But he is sore tempted because he he falls in love with women because he recognizes their beauty uh, and their 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 magic and their their um, their qualities. This I, I would even say superiority. Although I don't, I hope that the feminists don't take that football and run with it. But <laughs> uh, he recognizes this and does fall in love with women who, in turn, fall in love with him. Because um, they see that he's not treating them as prey or conquest or anything like that, but that they that he recognizes the beautiful essence within them. And one of the one of the, the in, in this book there are essentially three women: his wife Jacqueline, to whom he is devoted, and even after her death, and remains devoted; uh, Amina, 
who is an Algerian, French Algerian Muslim woman who has spent a long time in America teaching, but returns to Paris, who is much closer to his age. She's in her 60s, uh, whom he falls in love with, and a young uh, girl, not really a girl, she's 25 years old. She's a student, a very unusual person who's had a very unusual upbringing and has unusual qualities, with whom he also falls in love, and also they falls in love with him because of that, despite his age, although he's in very good shape for his age. Uh, but he knows he, he, he cannot, uh, he, he, he knows that he can't uh, bring that to fruition for many, many, many reasons. And what I wanted to talk about is the tradition in literature and in and the reality yeah. in life of older men and younger women. In literature, we, we have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Humbert Humbert and Lolita. That's one, one take on it. Uh, then we have Aschenbach, Gustav von Aschenbach in Thomas Mann's uh, Death in Venice, who falls sort of in love with a young boy. With the, but he, what he's falling in love with, I don't think it's homoerotic. I think rather it's the youth, potential, innocence, and the fuse of life in this child. And then there's um, Cohen in the Alexandria Quartet, who falls in love with an exotic dancer named Melissa. This Lawrence Darrell's Alexandria Quartet taking place in Egypt during the war, uh, and then the, I mean it, it goes it goes on and on and on. There are many 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 uh, instances of this, and the the uh, my my point in this uh, is that when you're when you're facing death, when you're old and you're about to die, you you grasp for uh, youth and potential and innocence and health, et cetera. And that's why you see, if you go to New York and you go to the, uh, the parts of Central Park that are on the face Fifth Avenue, you see all these older guys who are rich and powerful uh, with young, beautiful trophy wives and infants because they have thrown away their wives, which I think is an absolutely dreadful thing to do uh, because their wives are not nubile enough. Uh, nubile at all. They pass childbearing age. They get they get old. They throw away their wives, and they get a young woman who is who is fertile and uh, and has the fuse of life in her. And I think that's a very cowardly thing to do. It's a wrong thing to do. And despite the temptation, and I but I don't deny the temptation. The temptation is always there for a human being, especially one who's who's facing death. And how Jules handles this is different from the way it's handled. In those previous, um, I must say, masterpieces that I've that I've mentioned, uh, and that that's a uh, it's an interesting uh, twist. To be, yeah, talk, yeah. Uh, so the, the this woman's name Alodie uh, is uh, 24. She's a cellist, uh, a very promising player uh, that, that that's recognized by Jules. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about her and. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, I, your descriptions of her, uh, from from the standpoint of Jules, she sounds like the most beautiful woman in the world, uh, but also uh, is also um, uh, someone that you know, he is drawn to. As you mentioned, and this is uh, in the novel, it's it's almost for something else uh, oh, yeah. that that she represents. How do I mean? Have you interesting too? Have you have you encountered skeptics uh, as they've read your book on on this part of the novel? No, um, uh, what what I've encountered is uh, older women who 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 get threatened by it. Okay, and, and, and perhaps they don't even finish reading it. Uh, that's a terrible thing to say in an interview about a book. But perhaps <laughs> perhaps they didn't even go on because they they assumed that it would be treated the same way that uh, Nabokov or um, Darrell or um, uh, other people, uh, Thomas Mann, treated with Mann. It, it caused him agony. You know, he he didn't succumb to the temptation. He he couldn't even do it, but it caused him the an agony, which, in a sense, was a prediction of the First World War. It, it, if you read that Death of Venice, you see that in the very first paragraph. Yeah. No, I thought. I mean, as I read it, I mean, I, and I and I and I'm uh, love the way you 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 treated it. But I thought, you know, in the, the sort of the West that we're in now, uh, the question will be, what's the big deal? Uh, he's yeah. available. She's available. Why? Why? You know, this. The, you. You. You're for some reason beautiful uh, women, fifty years younger than you, are attracted to you. What's the problem? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, th there is a problem. You see, Casals, yeah. Pablo Casals, uh, married a woman 
uh, when when, the, when Casals was 80, he married a 20 year old, and and it was a big scandal. Um, and people said, well, well, how can you do this? You know, and he said, if she dies, she dies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but and of course, Strom Thurmond. Um, I right. never met Pablo Casals, but I met Strom Thurmond. He married someone who was about 60 years younger than him too. Uh, a I, beauty queen, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think that um, that this is. Uh, well, of course, it was Jerry Lee Lewis for those of you who are old enough, uh, who, who who married. He really dipped into the cradle. Uh, I uh, Jules is very moral, and he again, it's a temptation, that a temptation that a very strong temptation, and he does love her, and she does love him in any way, in a way because he understands her deeper qualities and really loves her for the right reasons. But but it, it's a temptation for him, and yet it doesn't cause him torture, because he he knows that it would not be right for her, it would not be right for him. Uh, it's not a question of the external morality or rules or customs or anything, but he knows it wouldn't be right for a, a, a 25-year-old girl, Elodie, to marry uh, a, a man who is... Uh, who is, is, is 75 and, and uh, also has a, has a problem with his, uh, with his health, although I'm, I must say he's very strong and athletic. Uh, and and I, by the way, I based, I'm 70, and I based all his measures, his blood work, his pulse, his blood pressure, his exercise regimen on my own. And, and, and this was a big mistake because I thought, well, you know, that's realistic. Here I am. I'm 70. Okay, he's, in the beginning of the book, he's 74. Uh, I'm 70, and this is me, so it's a realistic model. Painters have models. You know, even even the Leonardo and, and Michelangelo and Raphael worked from models. It's a good thing to do. And when one writes, it's a good thing to work from models because what what God has created is far superior to anything that man can not create, but rather represent. And so I always try to base it in in some sort of reality. And I worked, and I put my own uh, measurements in, essentially. Yeah, no. I got, I got all this flack because people said, well, a man of that age couldn't possibly uh, have uh, perfect blood work. Um, uh, and I, so you, do you have perfect blood work? I had when I, when, when I was writing okay. it. I, went, I had to go to the hospital because of right. an accident, and they took my blood, and they did all kinds of stuff. And the doctor came back, and he said, I've never seen absolutely perfect blood. All your values are right smack perfect. Um, so I, I threw that in, and uh, same with my pulse and blood pressure and, uh, and my exercise regimen, uh, which brings us back to rowing. You mentioned rowing. Yeah, no, because I, I, I wanted to say, you know, I started reading your novels. I had a four-month sabbatical here at Liberty Fund, and and I was working on a project during the day, and then at night I would read your novels. And I'll have to say, uh, your novels actually convinced me to get more serious about uh, my own fitness and uh, physical fitness. I always, I sort of did you know, sort of, you know, two mile runs or something a couple of days a week. But I, after reading your novels, I really, it really encouraged me to sort of break out of that uh, sort of, um, you know, week routine. So I, I appreciated the, 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 the details about his fitness routines and his, and his health uh, and the novel and, you know, made me, so I'm, I'm 38. So maybe when I'm uh, that age, I'll have perfect blood work. I don't know. Um, I like wine too much. I like beer too much. So maybe not, but those uh, those things I think are, are worthwhile. Something that it brought to my mind, and, and you make this point several times in the novel, is sort of the complacency of of living in a, you know a modern liberal democracy in the West. This sort of the comfort, uh, you know, death is not with us every day necessarily. Uh, there, you know, things are provided for you. Have to work hard if you you know want to die from disease or, or from uh, hunger or something like that. Death, we're, we're provided for so well. And here is your character, Jules, uh, working uh, extremely hard uh, at his at fitness, and he does it for one reason. Why he does it? He wants to be ready to fight and defend the things he loves if he's called to. Yes, uh, and I feel the same way. I've always felt the same way that it's my obligation to be uh, a, a fit, trained soldier. Now, I don't expect everyone to feel like that, uh, but. Jules learned uh, in this original sort of big bang of his life when his when his parents were executed in front of his eyes at age four that uh, the essential character of the world is is tragic uh, and I I believe that 
also. Um, to the extent that one is insulated from it, as we are in the West, uh, it's it's an illusion. Yeah, but yeah. The essential characteristic of, of the character of the world is tragic. And the only way to meet that is to work very hard, not just physically, of course. I mean, if you want to keep up your health, if you want to be able to defend yourself against an attacker, or if you want to be able to defend your country against uh, an, an army or whatever, you have to be, be you have that frame of mind. Um, but also in terms of higher things, in, in, in terms of making the, the best out of life and appreciating it, and 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 also loving properly, yeah, properly right. and more and morally. I mean, these are all things that you have you have to work at. You have to work at life. Otherwise, you become just a blousy um, uh, receptor of things that other people uh, provide for you, and that's 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 not good. Uh, all these virtues that are mocked now uh, and downgraded uh, are what what have have in the past saved humanity and will in the future. And my characters in all, in all my books are unashamedly that way. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm often attacked for that because, because it's not the, 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 the fashion now. You're supposed to be ironic and mock. Yeah. And, and uh, that's, that's silly and cowardly. No, I thought uh, one of the things about uh, Jules is Things are done in his life from an eternal perspective. Uh, yeah, to, to the way I read it, his uh, his love uh, for his wife uh, who died, uh, the music itself uh, for his daughter, for his grandson, he is continually drawn out uh, from himself, out of sort of the suck of self, which is our our, our cultural problem. I, as, as I read it. Uh, sort of the the individualism we don't realize we think it's so freeing and actually it's it encloses us within ourselves and we become unable to give or to see the purpose or meaning behind our our freedom uh, and our actions and choices and uh, Jules is not plagued by that you know he's his only you know, it seems to me it's sort of a half regret he wishes he had more money you know maybe if he had tried to be more commercial uh, with his talent uh, but that's not then really what provide, bothers then he could yeah, provide to he could provide the grandson just for that. But he has no real. But other than that, he's he's lived uh, to the full, and uh, he he knows what he's about. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, it's funny. I just realized that um, we have been so uh, sort of marinated in this uh, individualism stuff that the 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 way out of it, which the wrong way out of it, which many people have chosen, is collectivism. But it's it's the wrong kind dialectical of outcome of individualism. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, it is. I mean, I, maybe this is well known, and, and I'm just uh, I haven't encountered it, and I'm and I'm ill educated. But uh, instead of achieving the kind of of satisfaction from from living outside oneself that one would in a in a a, a morally sound culture, what we've chosen is to substitute uh, a false uh, collectivism imposed from the top uh, to try to to uh, get the yeah. same outcome, and it can never that can never work. No, I mean I think you know two twin uh, ideological heirs of modern thought. One is uh, autonomy, the other is collectivism, but they both meet uh, because they both want to liberate us from uh, love, relationships, trust, sacrifice. Uh, that somehow we could be liberated from nature, uh, from reason, from God, and be our own gods. I mean, I think you know, that's that's been very clear to me in in, uh, the, in the great autobiography, Witness by Whitaker Chambers. Uh, I think that's he clearly understands that. So. Yeah, and well, and he's not the only one. I mean, yeah. a, a lot of people do, at least on a gut level. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the, the great uh, divisions uh, in in, uh, in in modern life. Yeah. Well, uh, Mark, I really uh, appreciate your time uh, today in discussing uh, your new novel, Paris in the Present Tense, just released a few weeks ago, available at bookstores and, and an Amazon uh, click away. So I hope all of you will uh, buy it. Mark, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Richard. My pleasure. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.